Hello and welcome everybody, I'm Rob Averian and this is CK3's Dev Diary number 96. Today we got the Fate of Iberia 3D Art Showcase. And this one is a huge, huge dev there because it also dives into the background of what has to be done to actually get an asset into the game. It talks about what is considered when choosing what sort of assets you want to have in the game and my god, it has a lot of assets as well. I do want to say, you know, when we talked first about the fate of Iberia that I very much voiced my uh, disappointment when it comes to the question of where are the royal courts that might, you know, for example, make Iberia into a more specialized region, into a region where even the quotes look a bit different. I said that back then, I stand by that. I think this is a, a standing criticism that has to be launched, you know, as we uh, take a look at the Royal Court and how significant its development and, of course, all of the input of it was and how much it changes the gameplay, but then, you know, of course, has certain quotes spread around all the world. However, that criticism is sort of being minimized every time that I see just how much abundant details and assets and mechanics are in this feature pack. I'm very surprised by act by how much is actually in here. If you compare, for example, the feature density that you will see here to Northern Lords, then I gotta tell you, I am pretty sure that Northern Lords is getting demoted. Either way, there's a lot to look at. I just wanted to voice the topic of the Royal Courts again and why I'm actually getting a bit more neutral on it, because it's just so much. And because it is so much, let's immediately jump in. Waste no time and actually explore what can be found in the fate of Iberia as far as 3D art assets are concerned. I'm Lucia, one of the artists on CK3 and I will be your host for today. There's also Niels and Joachim, they will guide us today through everything related to clothing, you know, assets, uh, units, on-map assets and all that stuff. Let's take a look. Goals. With the struggle being the main focus of Fate of Iberia, we decided early on that we would put equal attention into the portrayal of both the Muslims and the Christians there. This is something that I think at this point has to be expected. They have been very thorough when it comes to regions. They don't just focus on one particular region. No, they go a bit further. They go out of, you know, the uh, zone I think that we were in with CK2 for quite some time. CK2 had a bunch of cultural areas that were <laughs> very much neglected. And I don't just mean, oh, they didn't make content for it. I mean that they were just regions where basically, you know, for example, when you take a look at Iberia, you focus on the Christians rather than the Muslims because that is what most people play. But the truth about of Iberia and about CK3 is that the entire region, no matter who you play, should be interesting. And this is one of the big steps here. Now, this is also something that is confirmed, not just with the mechanics, but also visually. Meanwhile, on the environment art side, the focus has been on bringing life to the, uh, to the Iberian map. You might remember a few of the monuments featured in last week's Dev Diary, but this time we will give you a sneak peek into the creation process. Let's take a look at the character assets. When designing new clothes, headgear and ha hairstyles, the first step, unsurprisingly, is to decide how they should look. We start by collecting all the reference material that we can find, put it in an enormous pile and begin forming an idea of what kind of assets we want to add. We also look for things like interesting and unique appearance, how well it will translate to a 3D model and if it fits in with other styles already in the game. Right, what we can see right here is... Uh, 12th century manuscript illumination depicting Alfonso II of Aragon. Uh, that's him. You can see the fairly similar pattern, I think. Although you can't exactly tell what is in uh, within the pattern, you can see that there's an undergarment right there. You can see that he's having a very, very good time. And then here is the actual outfit. Of course, we got the uh, piece of uh, concept art. This looks honestly very, very nice. I believe that this is indicative of probably what will be one of the lower tiers. You know, usually these assets, these outfits, they come in three tiers. They come in the high, in the middle, and in the commoner version, and the commoner version has fairly simple fabrics, and this kind of reminds me of that. It looks so nice, though, I gotta tell you. And then, of course, we have the actual pattern. You can see that this pattern is a bit smaller in real life, but I think this just comes across much more nicer once you're in a situation where it is a bit larger. And if I'm not mistaken here, is this the Fleur de Lis and uh, the icon that belongs to Granada? Am I wrong here? It, it really feels similar. Either way, that looks pretty good. Then down here we have a Muslim outfit. This one is based on this uh, the picture right here. The image depicts the Almohad Caliph Abu Hafs Umar al murtada wearing a loose robe known as Yuba. On the other uh, upper sleeves are soon on Tira Spence, a very popular fashion throughout the medi medieval Islamic world. Look at that. I wonder what was depicted on them. You can see it right here. That is a pattern. I wonder whether these were primarily patterns, what they 
uh, signified, right? Was it a family thing? Was it a virtue thing? Was it a religious thing? Was it a rulership thing? Of course, these are interconnected, but what was it primarily? I couldn't tell. Yeah, either way, I really, of course, do also like what this looks like. You can see the very different pattern shape here as well. This one itself didn't seem to have a pattern, at least not according to the depiction here, but you can very much see that, I mean, this just honestly, without a pattern, it just doesn't feel right. This looks pretty good. I wonder what the commoner version of this would look like as well. And then right here, the examples shown here are from an Andalusian manus a manuscript telling the story called Hadith by Yad Bariyad, an Arabic love, uh, love story, and the Libro de los Juegos, I do not speak Spanish or Arabic, just for the record, Book of Games, a 13th century book commissioned by Alfonso X of Castile, containing rules for a large number of medieval board games, as well as 150 miniature illustrations. Female and male fashions at this time generally had more similarities than differences, and sometimes it is even hard to tell whether an illustration portrays a woman or a man. This just comes down to how you cut clothes, how it is designed and such. The actual sort of uh, differentiation, the strong uh, diversion of these paths only sets in significantly later. And look at that, we have uh, different depictions right here. And I gotta tell you, I, I really like the way... Honestly, I love the concept art per se. I, I think I might just wear the more simple versions. This looks very, very... Uh, uh, special, right? Uh, it certainly does, but I gotta tell you, this looks like something you could wear in everyday clothes, even if you're not a king. So maybe as a count, this would be more appropriate. I would love to, uh, I hope at the very least, that they integrated the lower versions as they did in other games as well, or in other uh, assets as well, where you have the commoner standard and then high uh, uh, ruler sort of uh, deviations of the clothing styles. Anyway, looks very, very good. I really like the uh, hat here as well, or rather the uh, the uh, headpiece, right? Looks very, very neat, and, and I really like what they have done there. And you can see that it does, of course, if we actually look at this in comparison, you can see that it looks very, very similar the way it works, because why wouldn't it, right? This is the base core, this is the what the fashion was, and that is exactly uh, the way it was applied to both of these people in this context. Very, very neat that they researched that, very, very neat that we get this. Then here we have a Christian armor that is based on 13th century mural paintings of the conquest of Mallorca by James I of Aragon, presently found in the Museo Nacional d'Art de Catalunya in Barcelona. The sword with leaf-shaped pommel and guard decorations is based on a sword still in existence, allegedly from the 13th century at the Royal Armory in Madrid. Right, uh, you can see right here, this is what the motivation is. This is the actual sword that they base the sword in question right here on. And honestly, yeah, the sword looks really nice, the, the hilt right there. And then we got this outfit as the... Uh, base design, you can see that they free up this, uh, El Turanos does this as well in the assets that are in the community flavor pack, where if you have this sort of flap, it is always open, because otherwise you just can't see anything in the face, and of course for the interaction with the character, it is very important that you actually see their facial expression, as that plays a major role. I really do like this outfit in particular, honestly so far I think this is my favorite outfit, the Gambazon itself looks really really neat, and um, this honestly looks a bit low... Uh, resolution, but the Gambeson itself, I just love the way the material looks. It looks so firm. It really looks like it could be a real-life Gambeson. Anyway, this is a very, very cool asset. I always love it when we get a bit more intricate sort of uniform uh, uniforms for warfare. Big, big fan of that, and this is definitely a positive example. The helmet itself also looks absolutely grand. Uh, then down here we have, I mean, just amazing. I, I absolutely love this. What were they thinking? <laughs> what were they thinking? <laughs> Well, they were thinking, I'm gonna leave the house tonight and I'm gonna look stylish. This interesting looking headdress is based on numerous examples from both illustrations and sculptures and must have been considered extremely fashionable at the time. It was probably constructed from strips of ruffled linen or silk wrapped around a light wood base decorated with embroidered or woven bands and held in place by a barbette, so a chin strap. As with most things, the taller the better is the rule here. I can tell you from experience from interacting with modders that, uh many modders that orientate themselves on the historical examples get a question that happens to be repeated every single day. And that question is, are you mad? <laughs> why is the helmet, for example, in the uh, Ethnicities and Portraits Expanded mod, why is the helmet so tall? And the answer is because that's the way it was, you know, that is the way it was depicted, that is the way people wore it, and this is the exact same thing. I love this. Honestly, as somebody that has no idea about how this sort of specific hat fashion developed, doesn't this remind you a bit of uh, what, what soldiers looked like in the cent uh, 17th and the 18th century? Yeah, that's the one. Doesn't this kind of remind you of this? Maybe even uh, Napoleonic soldiers, the hat, right? How does that happen? The, the cavalry? Is this, based, is this related to this in any way? I have no idea, but it will be a pleasure 
to be a queen and wear this exact helmet. I love it. Now, something that I also love is actually this helmet. Whenever we have seen it in pre-footage, well, footage, in the screenshots and such, I thought to myself, this looks really magnificent. The way the turban wraps around the actual, you know, helmet and the way the helmet has the very nice decoration there, this just looks so good. Just, just look, and look at the gambas on. Man, I really wonder what this would actually mean. Is it just a pattern? Is it just a art? Is it is it writing? I couldn't read Arabic, but I gotta tell you, I highly doubt that this is Arabic writing uh, as it stands anyway. This looks really good. This, the Gambazon, or the Gambazons in, in general, I think, are my favorite outfit section so far on the on the body area, but I gotta tell you, this helmet is magnificent. It looks really good. If you are fighting somebody looking like this, you will immediately feel a bit more dread, I think, because they are so glamorous. The very badass helmet above might li uh, look like some impractical fantasy creation, but it is in fact on numerous depictions in the Cantigas de Santa Maria illustrations. The con uh, conical-shaped helmet is decorated with a large gilded metal leaf. A day when the rule of cool perfectly aligns with primary sources is a good day in my book. I agree. And then here we have another pretty funny helmet. If we're really lucky, there might be a suitable accident from that survi uh, f uh, f item that survives to this day. I can't read anymore. As is the case with this cup yellow of Fernando de la Cerda. Probably. The heir of Alfonso X of Castile, who seems to, Fernando that is, have had a very CK life and tragically died a father of two at the age of 19. This distinctive cylindrical headgear was usually popular in 13th century Spain. An excellent example like the one shown above is, of course, the ideal type of reference, but unfortunately very few medieval garments have survived in as good condition as this. You can see that they did something very smart here, of course. This is very, very specific. It has the pattern of Castile and Leon, right? And they substituted this by simply saying, you know what, we're going to go with the more generalistic concept, but we have this as the example that we can then use to actually make the helmet. I love this helmet. This helmet is great, this helmet is outstanding. We are getting such highly unique fashion. Um, I, I can't describe how excited I am. I think once we... Honestly, this pack really will make it difficult to play outside of Spain in vanilla just because of how ridiculously unique the outfits are. I love that, I really, really do. Not to mention, I mean, I, I gotta tell you, of course, I play almost always with CFP and EPE, but man, this really is very, very neat. I like what they have done when it comes to these. Now, let's talk about the character art process. You can see concept art right here. This is the, uh, uh, you know, address that we will see, I think, in a second further down the line. Indeed, we're gonna see this address being constructed. Once we have the finished concept art, we start off in a program called Marvelous Designer to create a 3D version of the garment. This is similar to designing clothes in real life as you work with sewing patterns that are simulated to create a natural fall. Again, whenever possible, we try to base the, uh, base the patterns on surviving examples. Technology. Outstanding. The pattern created uh, using Marvelous Designer for one of the new female Christian outfits. This dress, called a Brial, is constructed uh, based on historical patterns from similar garments that have survived, uh, survived to our time. We then add any additional details by 3D modeling in a program like Maya or ZBrush. In this case, the belt and brooch, uh, brooch at the neck were added at this stage. Right, there you go with the belt and there you go with the brooch. Oh, that's a cool brooch as well. We, we, don't, uh, we don't see these sort of cool, uh, very detailed ones all too often. This is the final high poly model right there. This model consists of several million polygons, which is too much to render in the game. Therefore, the next step is to create the low poly, meaning the model that will actually be exported to the game. We do this by matching the shape of the high poly model as closely as possible, but with, you guessed it, a much smaller number of polygons. Around 4,400, which is around 1,000 times less than the high poly model. That is insane. It reminds me, and I actually was there just recently, I, I, I saw it there. It reminds me of a very high poly reproduction of the Emperor's Crown, of the Holy Roman Emperor's, uh, Emperor's Reichskrone that was recreated so that the 3D printed product could be uh, displayed within the castle in Nuremberg. And that one is very, very interesting because it is so incredibly, incredibly detailed. I really wish they actually had also attempted to paint it, you know, in a uh, very realistic fashion. Even if you just have the pearls be, you know, just 3D printed resin, I would have really liked it. Instead, it was fully golden, if I'm not mistaken, and you can still see the details there. For CK3, that is, of course, far too much. Uh, you can see that they can break it down to some, you know, rather general uh, uh, poly numbers, and then you can actually implement it without having no frames whatsoever. The details are then transferred from the high to the low resolution mesh using a normal map. We do this in a software called Marmoset Toolbank. Isn't that crazy? I, I can't tell you anything. <laughs> I've seen this 
a number of times, you have this mass, uh, map as well. What is this called? This is called the normal map. If you have ever done map modding for Paradox game, then you will know this. This is the normal map. Yes, and this is the hype map, right? Uh, I've, oh, the curvature map. Well, same thing. Uh, I can't explain any of this, but these are all the things that have to be created that they do when they create an art asset. There's a lot of work going into this, as you can see. We create textures in a program called Substance Painter, but because we use dynamic colors and materials in CK3, the textures at this stage are mostly a neutral white. When you look at that, the belt looks very... Man, I, I love this belt, though. Before exporting to the game, we need to create something called Blend Shapes, which we use to deform the asset to fit different body types. We also do something called Skin Bind at this stage, which means attaching it close to the skeleton that animates the body. You can see different uh, body types right there, and then you can see my favorite image right here. It is a bit anachronistic, but don't lose your head over that. <laughs> um, finally, we are ready to export the asset and look at it in the game. This involves a considerable amount of scripting work to make sure the game knows how to find the asset and when it should show up, what it should be called, who should wear it, and so on. And here you can see the finished product. I gotta tell you, they have a thing in this... It looks good. These look really good, don't get me wrong. I really enjoy these dresses. I think they uh, make a great ensemble. The different patterns really add to the variance here as well. I love this crown. I really, really love this crown. Although, of course, it is stomped into the ground by this absolute masterpiece right there. But I gotta tell you, my god, they look so uncomfortable. They look so tight, right? Jesus. Uh, but but yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen that before, actually. Either way, these are really, really nice looking patterns. I hope that they made a bunch of patterns so that even if you have the same asset, the patterns apply in a fashion that make it so that they look really, really different. You have this effect to a degree in the regular game as is right now already, but not enough in my opinion. When you look at, for example, EPE, what they did was, right? EPE, this is my favorite thing about the entire mod. Whatever else they do, no matter how much work goes into it, it doesn't matter that much. In EPE, you have insanely good-looking outfits for the East Slavic population. They are this, this really colorful, this rich red. They have these very intricate patterns right here. And that alone, despite many of the assets, the types, what they are, right, being reused for others, like, for example, the Baltic Pagans or, for example, the Northern Pagans, this color scheme and the schemes applied to it actually make the asset unique just in that region, despite, again, the ac actual asset being applied in other regions as well. I hope that we can see a very similar effect here, where a really, really unique sort of a situation takes place, where all of this, these patterns, where I can have 15 women with the same dress in my court and yet they all look different. I uh, One can hope, right? But obviously I wouldn't know. Above you can see the final result with dynamic materials applied. We created new sets of patterns and color combinations for the Iberian assets, of which you can see more examples in the screenshots below. After all that is done and looking good, we can move on to work through the never-ending list of clipping bugs that arise when combining these assets with each other. Yeah, that's an absolute classic. Look at these assets. This is, first of all, this guy, this guy doesn't fool around. This guy doesn't play around. He is a, a competent and a very... High... <laughs> high confidence, man. <laughs> something is... Something about this particular... It's like... It, it, it's similar to that dress, I feel. It just looks like it's as tight as tight can be. You, you bought this, like, two numbers too small. You know what I mean? Uh, this guy as well. Either way, though. Um, I love the head cap, of course. Um, I really think that the patterns that we have... And this was what I brought up just now. The patterns are so expressive... Um, and they are so rich in deviation looking at this. I love this pattern in particular. I really like what they've done here with the basic. I love this pattern. I wish we could see more examples of that particular hat, but actually let me check something, right? We, we saw the hat earlier, and I'm sure... Is that the same pattern? Uh, because if it is... I think it's the same pattern, just a different color, right? But it still looks so significantly different. This, These are really nice assets. I like these essence. You can see the hat of Santiago, actually. These are the pilgrim hats of Santiago. Uh, if he was at Santiago, he would have put a seashell here. Maybe that's a feature. I really like, as well, the crown over here, or the, the circlet that this lady is wearing. And this, in particular, this outfit. I mean, this would be a rightful elderly uh, uh, wife of the Caliph, right? This looks, looks very, very cool. Uh, seriously, I am impressed, which is why I'm walking back the intensity of my negative criticism when it comes to no royal court coming with this update. I'm walking this back just a, just a nudge because, man, there are so many really good assets in here. I'm surprised, but it doesn't stop here. We're not even close to stopping yet. Iberian army units. With Fate of Iberia, we're adding two new sets of army units representing the Christian and Muslim styles to be used by Iberian heritage cultures. Of course, each model represents a specific tier of army quality, so we need to keep this in mind when designing the appearance. 
Generally, the first tier is supposed to represent something like a drafted peasant, the second tier a professional soldier, and the third tier a knight or equivalent. Below, you can see the concept art and 3D models for all three tiers of the Christian unit. The tier 1 model was mainly based on manuscript illustrations depicting commoners and peasants. As you can see, he's not wearing any armor at all. The simple armor of tier 2 consists of a gambeson and a steel helmet. Lastly, we have the tier 3 unit model. Its design is similar to the one used for the new Christian armor that characters can equip and was based on the 13th century mural paintings to the conquest of Mallorca of James I of Aragon. Currently found in Museo. Right, we, we already had that exact sentence there. Look at them go. They look nice. I I can't believe that they... The, the purple, of course, looks a bit out of place. It makes sense, it's Leo, right? So, the purple line right there, but man. Uh, very, very nice either way. Very cool stuff, actually. Like, seriously, when I look at these... I'm not sure whether I like these more, whether I like the Muslim variations more, but I'm honestly, I'm, I'm almost gonna say the Muslim variations... They look very, very neat. Uh, much like its Christian counterpart, the design of the Tier 1 Muslim unit represents an unarmored soldier wearing the same kind of clothes as a civilian. Tier 2 is also dressed similar to the Christian Tier 2, with a gambeson and a helmet. Finally, the design of Tier 3 represents a more heavily armored warrior with a hooded chainmail hauberk and a helmet with a nose guard. Yeah, look at him go right there. He, these, this looks really cool. Honestly, the gambesons, I, I gotta tell you, I, I think I just love gambesons. Like, <laughs> one of my favorite... Uh, uh, defensive uti uh, utilities <laughs> in the medieval period. What a highly specific thing to say, right? But they just look so nice. Anyway, ships. Uh, with a focus on Iberia and the intermingling and conflicts of the Mediterranean and Middle Eastern cultures, we have now added new ship type visuals for the, both the Mediterranean cultures as well as those of the MENA region. This should mean a lot less cogs sailing around the Mediterranean spare the odd invasion crusade or Viking raid. I love this and I need you to know that I do not care about ships at all. I, I have friends that care about ships. They they know everything about modern fleets and whatnot. But I love seeing the Latin seal, uh, sail, if that is how you pronounce it. That really will add a lot of flavor, for me personally, to the uh, Mediterranean. This was the predominant sail right there. It, it really indicates that somebody took the time to take a look at what they actually had at the time on the sea. Uh, very, very cool to see, and I hope that, of course, again, uh, this is something that adds to variety as you play. Holdings. Since Iberia was such a mix of cultures and architectural styles mingled between the cultures and religious influences, we have created a style that works for the area as a whole. Below you can see screenshots from the Iberian cities together with four new castle models. Right. Here we got the cities. Um, this looks a bit more Muslim, right? I mean, then again, this looks very Iberian, I guess, in general. And then here we have the castle stages, if I'm not mistaken. And this looks very cool. Yeah, it definitely has this sort of all-rounder style. I, I see what they did there when they say that they made this that uh, and it's meant to work uh, essentially for Iberia as a whole. Here we have the new church and mosque temple holdings. Yeah, this looks very, very cool. These are these are just neat assets. I really like just how much actually was... Th seriously, compare this to the Northern Lords. I, I, <laughs> I, I can't be too harsh on that at all because this is just... This has to be the new baseline. We have to take a look at this and compare anything future you know, that is a flavor pack to this sort of amount of content. But my god, this is really neat. Lastly, the models for new walls can be seen in screenshots below. I think this will probably be the biggest difference maker in terms of how I view a holding. Because, yeah, these look genuinely unique. This really will make them uh, stand out, I think, on the map. And that is, of course, exactly what it is. But standing out on the map, yeah, um, this is going to be a bit crazy. We haven't had this in CK3. We have had some specific, some unique locations, sure, right? But we haven't had anything that is as big and as significant of a map change as this. All over the landscape, you will now find multiple different kinds of monuments. Some magnificent works that have stood since the age of Rome, others that have been erected since, and some that are yet to be initiated by your architects. Like, for example, the Roman walls of Lugo. These walls in Galicia were built sometimes around 263 and 276 AD to protect Lugo, or Lucas Augusti, as it was known to the Romans. Somebody pointed out on my Discord, they can't get this out now. This looks so weird because it's like bending down, but from the distance you wouldn't see that. I gotta tell you, I love this. I have been in the camp heavily of some sort of city sprawl for a while. I made my own road, right? I made my own road in as a mod for my series. Um, but this is actually really interesting. When I talk about City Scroll, what I think about is really tiny, fairly tiny, like a village over there, a village over here, and these start growing, tiny roads are constructed as you go and as your development of your province increases. But something as massive as this 
is definitely something that I also love. I would like for the both of them to be combined. If you're a tiny city sprawl, like tiny villages, not the classic like, oh look, there's an amassment of houses around this. No, no, more like the province as a whole becomes richer. There are more areas that are now, you know, inhabited, that sort of stuff. If you combined this, but then had a massive county center, man, I would be, I would be ecstatic about this because this really will make it significant if you roleplay like I do, this will make it significant to take this castle, to take this county. It will make it significant because this will genuinely feel like you just did something. You took something that is so significant that it is this big on the map. I like this philosophy. I want to want to stress on top of that, I would like to have like a tiny non-random, you know, like uh, predetermined, for example, that if you have a level of 20 development, there's a village here. If it's 40, there's a village there on top of it, right? I would love that, but I like this pivot towards saying, you know what, make it big. Make it significant. When your character rides into these walls, he should be aware of how important that is. I love these models. I, I gotta tell you, a big, big fan of working with monuments and landmarks. Now, let's expand on that. On that. I know that PDX Thalassic is working on CK3. PDX Thalassic have worked on Imperator Rome. They created the monument feature and I believe the 3D assets, although those could have been outsourced, I'm actually not certain. But either way, PDX Thalassic, please. Let me build a monument and make it as interesting as Imperator Rome rather than as kind of boring as CK2, which was a pure money sink. This right here is the feature that could allow us this as well. Maybe they're already working on this. I mean, I would be I would be ecstatic about that as well. Just like with units, we try to hold off from investing too much of our polygon uh, budget into the 3D models for holdings and monuments. Below you can see a screenshot of the low poly model of the Roman walls of Lugo. Right, look at that. Yeah, it is fairly po uh, low poly, but I mean, that is how it has to be. Mosque of Cordoba. The Great Mosque of Cordoba is claimed to have been built on the site of a Visigothic basilica and is one of the oldest structures uh, still standing from the Muslim era of Al-Andalus. Looks great. I mean, what can you say? Just looks really good. I like that that is now in. This was, of course, a big factor, you know, or a big uh, power play, basically, in the uh, Caliphate in the south. So very excited to see that now uh, depicted on the map in all its glory. The Alhambra, one of the distinct monuments of Iberia from the base game that has now gotten some visuals. A fortress palace whose construction began or which construction began in 1238 historically. Will you begin the construction early to show off your splendor? So correct me if I'm wrong here, right? But I'm pretty sure the Alhambra is an old abandoned Roman fortress. And I think it exists in that way in CK3 as well. It's a special building right now, right? So I assume that there, there has to be like a ruin status of this. And then the monument is erected in this glory once you actually build it up. By the way, very, very excited to see it. Look at how nicely it fits into this region here. Yeah, I'd really like just imagine there's like a couple of trees. There's like a little road goes to this village. And then there's a road that goes to the Alhambra. I really want more of on-map um, on visuals. It looks stunning. It looks great. Give us more. Now this one is just nice. Santiago de Compostela. The cathedral construction historically began in 1075, was built in the Romanesque style. By the modern-day cathedral has seen its facade rebuilt and modernized over the centuries, we have recreated the original look of the cathedral for this era. Very, very cool. This is a beautiful, beautiful on-map monument. This is, this is gorgeous. Um, and now imagine if this was tied to a game mechanic where over time you can use different materials, it will change, you know, what the material is. Over time, it will gain maybe some factors. You can, can maybe, you know, influence it if you are a foreign conqueror, that sort of stuff. Hey, I'm just nudge nudge, I'm just saying, bring back Imperator Rome monuments to CK3. And then over here we have a lighthouse, look at that. I assume, what is this, uh, Santiago, is this like a, a Santiago lighthouse? Is there a lighthouse in Santiago? I have to assume there is, right? Was, was that mentioned before? Anyway, there's the lighthouse. I think it was mentioned before. Now let's move on to artifacts. We talked about that as well. I suggested back then that we saw the artifacts in the inventory because that is if you don't own the royal court, but if you do own it, you can make them into uh, uh, actual court artifacts. Let's take a look. If you have the royal court expansion, you will also be finding some of these new artifacts having unique visuals when presented in your court. But worry not, artifacts are also available as trinkets if you don't have the royal court to display them in. You're gonna have the bells of Santiago <laughs> in your inventory. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of funny to me. Akmanil, right, look at that. That's the lion right there. Ah, uh, yeah, he's a he's a cute little lion. And look at them stand here. Yeah, I know. I, I gotta tell you, I think these new outfits really, really will be neat. I want to say different throne room would have been nice as well. I, I can't let go of that, but 
at the same time, man, it looks nice. When you look at this, you can see the Bells of Santiago actually in the back after they've been reforged. And here we have an uh, armillary sphere, if that is how you pronounce it, which is, of course, uh, m m used in uh, astronomy. Uh, so, yeah, very, very cool. This one is actually, wow, very cool down here. I didn't even notice that, actually, until just now. I like this. I wonder what the exact effects will be of these artifacts. How strong will they be? Will we see power creep, or will it actually be a balanced sort of thing? Uh... Interesting. After reference gathering, a low poly blockout is created for artifacts, so this is how to create an artifact. Below you can see the blockout model for the armillary sphere, with a base mesh of a CK3 character next to it for scale. It's important to make sure that the silhouette and the shapes appear distinct and are readable from a distance, since artifacts are seen from a certain distance by the player in the courtroom. Yeah, you don't actually ever go that close, so you need to make it in a, in a way, of course, where it can be identified even from a distance. High poly details are added in ZBrush, after which a game-ready low poly model is created in Maya or Blender. Uh, Elteronus has definitely told me similar things, where what you use in CK3 is much, much lower poly count than it is uh, as you create it. But you look at that. That is uh, how you make that. Could I make that? Can you make that? Uh, well... Uh, not unless you invest uh, hundreds of hours, I guess. Votive Crown. A votive crown is one not meant for wearing. Instead, it is a religious offering made for display and to be suspended at altars or shrines. Just like a regular crown, they consist of fine craftsmanship, precious metals and stones. Most of the surviving examples of these today come from 7th century Visigothic Iberia. This, I believe, is directly inspired, if not the exact same structure, of uh, something that is very much still displayed in uh, an Iberian... An Iberian uh, museum. This, honestly, is probably my favorite artifact. This just just looks so good. This looks so beautiful, man. I I, I yeah no th this is just gorgeous. I I gotta tell you, Tizona, one of the two swords of the famous El Cid, the other being the sword known as Colada. Its design is based on the museum displayed sword claimed to be the famous blade. El Cid died in 1077, right? So I assume that he has it on his person in 1066. Look at that sword, though. Yeah, that's a very neat sword. Is that... Is that actually the... Like, you know, what they say is that this is what the museum says, uh, you know, as the... Is the sword, but isn't this a bit complex? I always thought that this sort of... Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of decoration on the hilt here only came later. But then again, what do I know, right? A anyway, very, very cool. Big, big fan that we actually have this artifact. I wonder whether you can interact with it uh, differently, or you know, whether it gives you different bonuses depending on where you stand when it comes to the Iberian struggle itself. Chessboard. In Iberia, games of skill and tactics were highly praised, and multiple types of chess can be acquired. Uh, ooh, multiple types of chess can be acquired to show your strategically inclined mind. I wonder whether the quality differs. Whether you get a low or a high quality chessboard. Oh, yeah, that's pretty cool. We can see the, <laughs> the, the bells yet again. Just in the background. Bell of Santiago, here we are. This grand bell, which you might remember being featured in the previous dev diary, if recaptured and recast, can be put in your code to display that feat. I like it. And somebody actually, Gia, pointed out in, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a conversation, hey, couldn't this just be used in a really cool way by after the end for a bell artifact? The, you know, the, the American freedom bells or whatever, right? Hmm. I think this could be an option. I would love it if you could build... <laughs> If I could build a core just with bells. I, I, I listen, I... Uh, <laughs> come to the bell end. Uh, come to the bell end now. Alright, this is it for this dev diary. I gotta tell you, I can't give you too much insight, of course, on the creative processes behind it, but I like going through them nonetheless, so that we know exactly how much work and what went into it. If you want to know more, then you can see right here, on May 18th, uh, from 2.30pm to 4pm, we will host an art livestream with several artists from the team. Definitely make uh, sure to check that out. It ain't much, but it, it's honest work. Yep, this is a good fella right there with a Santiago hat. I like it. And that is today's Dev Diary. Uh, very, very excited. I gotta tell you, in hindsight, you know, when this was announced, I definitely was thinking they can't have enough assets to actually make this worthwhile. They can't have enough for me to say I can be okay with no royal code being added in this free patch that accompanies the flavor pack. But I have to say, I'm impressed. I am very impressed with what we are getting, especially with the on-map depiction. Ultimately, we have Mediterranean and Muslim codes in the royal code already. I wish we had gotten more distinct codes just for Iberia. There are very distinct codes, of course, but as it stands, I can't believe that this is just a flavor pack. I'm very positive towards that. Let me know what you think and how it compares to, for example, Northern Lords. Um, but this is it for today. I'll see you later. Alligator.